uh, could uh, this meeting is being recorded i just pressed got it great good morning everyone i'm nancy wood the president and ceo of the century city chamber <clears throat> of commerce so the role of the chamber is to bring uh, people together to collaborate and uh, get to know each other better and do more business together and to support our businesses in Century City as well as provide information and resources. And typically that's about the community and doing business in Los Angeles. But for today, the information is uh, provided by our Arts Council about is the NFT revolution over? And we're so pleased to present this panel. And now I'd like to introduce the chair and founder of our Arts Council, Jean Tardy Vallernaud. Thank you, Nancy. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, the Arts Council is um, just about to celebrate its 13th anniversary or birthday. And this today is our 24th <clears throat> excuse me, our 24th um, panel event, in addition to which over the years, we have curated two <laughs> exhibitions of public art uh, throughout Century City. Um, our mission is to bring art to the community, art to people, and to bring people to art. So without further ado, um, I will ask Nancy, I mean, I beg your pardon, I will ask Agnes, Pino to introduce our speaker. Agnes, please. Um, thank you, Jean. Um, I'm so happy to have you um, all today. And um, because when we decided to have a panel on NFTs, it was quite selfish at first because we were all lost and we just wanted to know what was uh, all the fuss about. And um, so that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. And, uh, and we are very, very honored to have three of the most regarded NFT specialists with us. We have Muriel Cancar. Um, she's, um, she's going to moderate the panel. She's a curator, a praiser in contemporary art. And as an advocate of uh, technology-driven practices, she lectures and consults on computer-generated um, art, such as NFTs. Then we also have Sarah Conley Orden Kirk. Um, she's a lawyer and a co head of the Art Law and NFT Practice Group in Beverly Hills. And, and the last panelist is Peter Wu. He's an LA based artist who generates artworks and immersive, immersive environments. He also founded Epoch Gallery, an artist run virtual experiment. He notably created a virtual exhibition that investigates the excavation area of the Ely County Museum campus. And now let's, uh, with, um, without further ado, Muriel, please, please tell us more about NFTs. Hello, um, I will, hello all. I'll ask Nancy if you can bring up the slides. So we can, I will try to give you a brief introduction. So you all can have to go through those because um, those were the introduction slides. Um, if you could directly to the six, number six slide. Yes, right here. And we don't see it all, but I think we see enough of it. Okay, well, I was saying that I will try to give you a brief introduction on NFT, not to bore you with too much uh, technical details, but um, to provide you enough as a base for our discussion. Um, so what are NFTs? NFTs can be considered as um, metadata. They are units of, um, of digital data that um, are stored on the blockchain, such as um, they can be traded. So think of units of data, think of tokens, and um, it, will it will become a little more intelligible as we, we go through this presentation. Um, I wanted to say words about non-fungibility. What does non-fungibility mean? Um, as opposed to fungibility, which is used for currencies such as um, the dollars, for instance, non-fungibility means that 
each one of these tokens is unique and it is indivisible. So we can compare this to tickets, for instance, for an opera or for a flight. Um, two tokens may look alike, but like two tickets for to take uh, you know to take a plane, but they will only give you access to um, different sets. So different sets, different price. So we go back to the idea that it is indivisible and is valued at different um, value level. Today, most of NFTs are minted on the Ethereum blockchain. There are others, but we talk about the, the most common standard is ERC721. And they are powered by what we call smart contracts. So what is a smart contract? Uh, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but think that they handle all the transferability and they allow um, to assert ownership of the token. So um, we are going to go to the next slide. Thank you, Nancy. The term smart contract may be a little bit confusing. We can think of them uh, as contract. We can literally think of them as little uh, as contract. And Sarah will tell us more about this uh, in the sense that they, they do set parameters for transaction, uh, but really what they are, they are self-executing lines of codes. And I was once told that Sarah, who is actually here with us today, referred to them as are mature, and I do not even know if that is true, and I would love for her to explain on that, because I found that was an extremely well um, thought about terms for actually smart contracts. The blockchain, um, so the smart contract, think about them as a little, you know, application, little or not so little application that runs on the blockchain. But then you ask me, what is the blockchain? So next slide, please. Here is a blockchain. You can think of the blockchain as an accounting ledger. It's in fact, it's a decentralized ledger. Um, it, is a, it is like a database that's stored in the forms of blocks and each block is connected to the other block, the previous one and the next one. Therefore, we call it a blockchain. Um, they are, those um, are decentralized, meaning that instead of having like a system of computers that are all connected to a central unit, we have different multitude of nodes, that's how we call those computers, that are not connected by a central actual unit, a central system. So this is, I think, an important concept that blockchain brought, this idea of decentralization. And um, we can go to the next slide to now talk about NFTs. And the fundamental principle of NFTs, because if blockchain is um, something that has a long history, um, even before Bitcoin, I'm sure you have all heard of Bitcoin, the first cryptocurrency that was created in 2009. Um, blockchain pre-existed that and it has a long history um which i'm not here to say to tell today but nfts um are really grounded in the research of artists and in artists and dance so um you what you see here is what is considered as one of the first nft by an artist based in new york called kevin mccoy and the piece is called quantum and this was minted in 2014 when NFT wasn't a thing. The term did not exist, but his idea was to record some data of the blockchain. Why? Uh, we're going to go to the next slide. So artists like Kevin McCoy, when they created those uh, this, this technology, what they considered is one thing they considered is um, this Artist rights, um, I mean, we call it the artist reserve rights transfer and sell agreement. And this was designed in 1971 by um, a conceptual art impresario called Seth Siglobe and a lawyer called Robert Prudzinski. And this was uh, meant to protect the interest of the artist, particularly when it comes to um, reproduction, resale, licensing. Um, 
And the other model that ideas, concept that artists were thinking about is, next slide please, the idea of certificate of authenticity. Um, the um, artists like Kevin McCoy wanted to find a way to prove ownership uh, of um, their digital artworks, right? And those artists operate in the digital space, uh, not dealing with tangible object. And the question of the ubiquity of digital arts and uh, the lack of um, possibility to get it to make it scarce and prove ownership of the work was a problem that they have been thinking about a lot. Now, um, what you see here is a piece of paper on the, on the left of your screen. It's a certificate of authenticity that was created by artists called Sol Lewitt to prove that um, you could own his work. What you see on the right is a white it's a wall painting or drawing by this artist Sol Lewitt and, and a certificate proof that you are the person who has it is the owner of the, the wall drawing. So for instance, in this case, if Sarah has a Sol Lewitt on her wall, lucky her, uh, she owned that piece of paper that is dated and signed by the artist and also explain how to create the work. Now, if she sold the work to Peter and she passes the certificate of authenticity to Peter, even if she has still the painting on the wall, she's supposed to destroy it, but even if she kept it, it's no longer considered a layweight. So we can think of NFT in that way. If we go to the next slide, Nancy, you'll see a CryptoPunk here, which is a digital artwork, I mean, our collectible, that is actually um, possible for anyone to have on their, you know, on their computer, on their phone. Sarah could have one on her phone. Peter could have one on his computer screen. It doesn't mean they are the owner. The owner of that particular CryptoPunk as of today is the owner of the Ethereum wallet, which is the number I put in here. And from what I, I don't know, it's anonymous because this is a thing. Anonymity is a thing on blockchain. So we don't know. Then maybe Peter, then maybe Sarah, I doubt so. So next slide. Here, what I did is I pulled some um, of the, um, it's a screenshot from the Board Ape Yacht Club. So you may, I'm sure most of you have seen those like funny looking little monkeys um, and who trades for huge amount of money. Um, they're actually, um, they have very, they're very well built as NFTs. And if you go to their website, you can find on this, this page, um, the different number that will give you uh, what we call the trend, I mean, the transaction, the contract, the smart contract number. And then if you go to the next slide and see, then you'll see a list of all of the transaction ever since they were first minted, recorded on the blockchain, and every time there is a transaction. So that establish a provenance history. And then you would know that when you buy something from someone and you transact on the blockchain, every single transaction prior to this one going back up to the creator is being recorded. The next slide. That is to give you an idea of how a smart contract looks like. It's a different language called Solidity, and it's uh, to us non-intelligible, but it's how it does look like for people who actually can code. Um, next slide. Now, where do you buy NFTs? You can buy NFTs on marketplaces. The most, um, probably the, the, the broadest one being OpenSea, which um, is also sort of an aggregator because it gathered um, sales from other platforms. Uh, on the next slide, you will see um, other marketplaces. Uh, until recently, those marketplaces, those exchanges, they were actually working with um, specific blockchain. Look, like for instance, Ethereum, there are several um, marketplaces like OpenSea, but Foundation, Superior, Nifty Getaway, that will sell Mint, allow artists to Mint and sell works. And then you can buy and you can also resell on secondary market on those platforms. Um, 
but they are also blockchains. So for instance, Tezos, which is very, very active in the art community, has a number of platforms you can buy on. You can browse to see the art and you can also buy from um, like Object, like FX Ash and so on. And as a bot blockchain that we are probably going to discuss with Peter is Algorand. This is where Peter is minting his epoch project. So, um, the next uh, and last um, information I'd like to bring to your attention is that there are a multiplicity of type of NFTs. So I, I just made these two slides. One is on um, NFTs as art and collectible, and the second one will be about utility NFTs. So in terms of art and collectibles, um, the very simple kind of be created with uh, NFT we have seen around our memes and PFP that stand for picture for proof. Those are the board apes that we discussed earlier and the crypto punk. Then you have, you know, traditional art in a sense, you know, image like little animation, videos, film that can be minted also as NFT. Um, then you have um, a form of art that has really, really took off with um, the possibility to mint and to own um, digital art. This is what we call generative art. Those are artworks and animation that are made from algorithms. Um, and But with the intention of an artist who either created his own code and algorithm or is using um, an algorithm, an existing uh, algorithm. Then you have uh, artists like Peter who works with virtuality, like virtual environment that can exist in the world as augmented reality, as virtual reality, and we'll, Peter will talk to us about that. And then you have photographers, you know, that use NFT to mint and, and certify provenance. Now, on the next slide, you'll see um, that um, Actually, NFTs can also, and this is very interesting, but we won't have time to develop. Um, but NFT also have, some of them have inbuilt utility. That's for instance, allowing you, for instance, for the gaming uh, people, then you buy an NFT that is going to allow you to, to defeat an adversary in a video game based on um, you know, the function and the quality of, 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 your, of your NFT. Of, um, it can also grant you access to, um, you know, real world thing like country club, for instance. Uh, so different industries have been using it, like the luxury industry, the music industry to create those like customer driven, you know, marketing, um, you know, efforts, outreach. And uh, it's also interesting to note that some NFT can also have underlying um, can also deal with underlying asset and ownership and the right issue, which is something we'll discuss with Sarah. So here we go. Um, I'd love to um, invite Peter to, and I hope that gives you a little bit of an understanding of what NFTs are and how do they function and what they can allow, because then with NFTs comes a lot of questions and issues. And I'd love to invite Peter to, um, tell us how and why he started to use NFT, because I think his, uh, his artworks and project is one of the more relevant currently in the, in the space. So it really is uh, an, a, pr a privilege to have him here today with us. And they are next slides. I think before, if you go to next slide, Nancy, and I'm so sorry, I forgot a little details. If you want to learn more about NFTs, uh, you can, Go, don't hesitate to go to crypto news outlets. Sometimes they sound a little jargony, but there are some very good pieces uh, in and very accessible in websites like CoinDesk, Decrypt, or um, others that you may find you know, relevant for your own needs. Then the next slides will be, if you are very much into the art, there are two websites that I would recommend that writes greatly about uh, NFT extensively and only about NFTs and digital art. Those are Outland and right click and save. Um, but next slides will get us to Peter's work. Hi, uh, thanks Muriel. <clears throat> um, hi, yeah, my name is Peter and I'm based in Los Angeles and I started Epoch at the beginning of the quarantine when all of us artists and uh, professionals lost all our opportunities and showing uh, 
um, showing opportunities. So um, I thought it was a new way to try to kind of break out outside of the white wall and think about how to show work within a virtual environment. <clears throat> so uh, the very first EPOC exhibition was really on this really stark island and it was really kind of reflecting how we're all feeling alone in this our own little houses and stuff like that. And um, I invited, uh, I think, seven or eight artists to be in that exhibition. And um, after that, it kind of took off because, you know, there was no other places to go as in museums or anything else to go see artwork. So in a certain time, uh, quarantine kind of in a certain way exploded um, the user engagement for EPOC. <clears throat> Now, the whole time, I'm each exhibition is set in a different environment. The one you're looking at right now is called Cryosphere, which was the show before the present one that I have up right now. And <clears throat> this was based on, uh, on, on, a, on a glacier in uh, Alaska. So I recreated the glacier, the topographical map of the glacier, which uh, and then and curated seven artists within this exhibition and placed their works along uh, and, and within the glacier. Um, and you can kind of go around, if you go on the website I left in the chat, you can kind of go and experience these exhibitions on your own time. And <clears throat> you can just, it's kind of like a point and click system. So if you see an arrow or a circle, you can point and click and move through it. So anybody who was uh, early into gaming, the game missed back in the day kind of navigates that way. Um, so essentially what I'm doing is creating context for artists. So outside the white wall, so I'm creating these specific contexts. And usually of late, I've been using architecture and, and charged places that exist in the real world and Linda, place them in virtual. The world. Yeah. Two things. And um, uh, yeah, so I've been so that in a certain way creates a tether to like a criticality that sometimes fantastical environments or 3D environments can't really relate to. So if you go to the next slide, I think. Thanks, Nancy. Okay, so that's another version of another view of, um, of Cryosphere, which also has a map that pops up and then you can click and kind of jump around the glacier. Um, and this, uh, exhibition, I, I also introduced uh, equitable model. So with the smart contract that Muriel was bringing up, um, I have split all the proceeds. So I think this one, uh, I think 65% or something goes to all and split between all the participating artists. So any edition has been sold, it goes split between all the artists. And I think 15% goes to uh, a charity in Alaska that works with uh, uh, climate change and whatever not. So I was really trying to think about a new way to kind of, I know this is a huge jump from what you just learned, but uh, I'm kind of, what I'm trying to do is think about NFTs and the space itself and what is missing and kind of pushing forward um, this kind of space. So instead of selling a JPEG, <clears throat> what I do is I sell the whole exhibition as one artwork which basically is sold as a standalone app that's saved on the IPFS, which is basically, it's called the interplanetary file system, which is a really ridiculous name, but that's where all basically a lot of these NFTs are sold. I mean, are saved. So then, um, and that's a decentralized uh, storage system that's on the internet. And usually when you buy it, you get a link and then you can download this, the file, which is sometimes between two to six gigabytes and you get to navigate through it. Now, uh, you can't take any of the works out, but all the works are included within the exhibition. So you kind of navigate it as, as, as a video game, but also like, so uh, in a certain way, I'm, I'm kind of pushing that envelope of what an NFT can be other than a JPEG or a GIF. And I'm kind of trying to figure out how to make an equitable system as well, which uh, in a certain way kind of, uh, I'm trying to certainly challenge the, the, the regular art world and how they uh, kind of go about business. Um, for example, like if you're an artist and you're a group show in a real gallery, uh, if you don't sell your work, then you don't get a cut. So every single time an edition sells, and usually these editions are between five and maybe 10 editions. And, uh, you know, each time they sell, then they, the, the foot proceeds automatically are distributed into each our artist's wallet and it takes on Algorand, which is the blockchain I'm on, 4.5 seconds to execute. So there's no waiting for an artist to 
get the collector to the, the gallerist to get the money from the collector to get it to the gallery. And then the gallery has to write the check to the artist. So it kind of speeds up a lot of things and there's none of that you know, conflict anymore between artist and gallery and not getting paid. Um, did I miss anything, Muriel? What else is going on? Can you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> okay, so this is the current exhibition, which is called Unprotected. And uh, I, during the overturn of Roe vs. Wade, I gathered uh, nine artists and we had discussion about uh, what, what we, we can do. And they're all nine women artists that are all over the, the globe. And so I uh, asked one of the, my friends that were in the show is Nancy Baker Cahill. And I was like, okay, what do you want the environment to be? And she says, automatically, the SCOTUS building, the Supreme Court of the United States. So I was like, okay, I can model that. So what I essentially I did is I modeled the entire uh, building and you can walk inside it and around it. And then we placed all the artworks uh, on, uh, on the grounds and inside the building. So essentially it's nine artists in protest to the Roe versus Wade overturn. And 50% uh, of the proceeds go split between the artists and 25% will go to reproductive justice organizations at the end of the, exhi at the, end of the exhibition run, uh, I think in a couple of weeks. So yeah, so this is the current one that's on, online. You can see all the exhibitions I've done with the link that's in the chat and you can take your time and navigate through. Um, for people that aren't used to virtual worlds, it may be a little bit jarring, kind of figure out where you are because, you know, it, your body isn't there. So you're kind of having to navigate and, and play it like a video game. You can use your cursor buttons too. And so, um, yeah, so in a certain way, uh, Epoch in a, is a kind of a very subversive <laughs> social political kind of uh, platform for artists to kind of uh, show their works. And 90% of the people I work with are women, queer, trans, and artists of culture. And I'm really trying to uh, push the, these marginalized voices because within the NFT space, there aren't many, uh, uh, the majority is, is still reflecting the same uh, demographic as, you know, the, 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 the art world in itself. So in a certain way, blockchain and NFTs, you know, we're seeing a lot of things where the marketplaces and everything, it's really an acceler acceleration of the same markets that we have in our existing real world. And what I'm trying to do is figure out as an artist and, uh, and conceptually how to challenge these systems, how to uh, talk about something that is happening in the real world that isn't just stuck virtually. And <clears throat> um, yeah, so, and so for when I'm talking about the marketplaces that Muriel brought up, I'm kind of anti-marketplace where I don't participate on them and everything is sold directly from my site and which is linked to the blockchain and uh and it, and it, it, it you know the, the the transactions go on algorand which is a different kind of blockchain than ethereum and um yeah um thank you peter and i think this is very interesting what you said that um you talk about the fact that nfts were accelerating the commercialization and I would say of our, the art world, and I would say even the financialization, because we now see something I didn't touch on during the presentation, but certain artworks are being um, fractionalized. So mm -hmm. a fund, for instance, will own an artwork that they will actually divide in um, various shares that can be then owned by multiple owner. And that is, um, it's it's it has set an advantage, but it's also giving uh, way to more even more speculation. Yeah. And so, I'd love for Sarah to now sit in and say a few words. Uh, Sarah, would you like to introduce how you work, or maybe how you came to get interested in working with NFTs? I know you have probably more than an hour, hours to talk to us about your background with NFTs, but maybe like the, the big, you know, events. And, and then maybe this could lead us to talk about contracts, smart contract, but also contract agreement, right agreements and, and loop this in with um, Peter's um, process and practice. Sure. So thank you for having me here. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody. And um, yes, we've got days, right? We, we're not restricted by time today. Um, 
So I originally got involved actually in conjunction with uh, the same artist that, that Peter was referring to, Nancy Baker Cahill, uh, and I connected a number of years ago on um, some conversations around um, different opportunities for artists, both within the, the realm of artist rights and um, talking about uh, ways to advocate. And I got very interested in blockchain as um, a possible way for the artists that I work with who are conceptual artists to create something that could be sold. So um, you referred earlier, Marielle, in your presentation to the fact that I've used the word armature instead of smart contract. I am just so offended by the word smart contract. I had to come up with some other way to refer to um, the code that underpins NFTs or in the case of, of um, Peter's um, uh, artworks, you know, this it's on a different blockchain. So they're referred to as ASAs, but it's, it's essentially the same thing. The, the issue I have is that these smart contracts are not smart contracts. They're neither smart nor are they actually contracts. As you properly um, said in your presentation, um, they are lines of code that direct the transactions and create a record on the blockchain. That's all true. But in terms of actually having terms or nuanced uh, relationships referenced within the, the, those lines of code, there's nothing like that. We're working now, um, I'm working with a number of different developers and blockchains to try to um, have uh, uh, some more standards imposed in terms of what the metadata shows in the field so that when you're looking at the description of NFTs on a marketplace, you can see other information that may be referenced, such as copyright notices or other rights that um, attach to the NFT or, or rights that don't attach to the NFT. That's not going to be anything that's contained within the, the smart contract itself. It'll be something else that's attached on IPFS, as Peter referred to, um, the, uh, the decentralized system that holds most of the artwork. Anyway, um, to get back to your question, um, I, I was really interested in this, this ability for artists to um, create a product that could be sold from something that otherwise was conceptual in nature and would not be sellable. Um, so that's where it sort of started. And then um, I uh, worked with Nancy. We collaborated on a project right after uh, the NFT uh, market exploded last year with the Beeple sale, um, which I can't believe you got through a presentation without mentioning the Beeple sale, which is kind of refreshing. Um, and uh, that was really a project that focused on um, uh, uh, contracts at a number of different levels. So contracts in terms of it being a social contract and Nancy's work is very um, subversive and um, she is a huge advocate for uh, the environment and for human rights and social justice. And so her work always has some um, core message to that effect. And um, so she created these beautiful pieces that were um, dissolving handshakes in front of various institutional settings. And then I worked on the underlying actual contract that attached to the NFT um, that discussed the obligation of the collectors in, in working, uh, in, in collecting that work. Um, so that was fantastic. And, and in fact, I had the great privilege of working with Peter as well on um, his projects in working on the collector's agreements and, you know, figuring out ways to actually bring real um, understanding and artist rights articulations to these projects because they otherwise don't exist. And that's one of the challenges within this space is that if we're pushing just the marketplace and just the PFP projects and the memes and those things that are really kind of... Um, meant to, to drive up prices. And, and this is where the whole space really gets kind of a bad reputation for being a place for scammers and pyramid schemes. And that is, in fact, a lot of what's going on there. But that's different from what's happening within the artist community. And I think it's very important for people to be able to separate that um, in, in terms of getting involved with the, with the space in general, um, figuring out if you, you know, if you want to collect, if you want to um, uh, support artists or support causes, there are ways to do that through these mechanisms that are on blockchain. And I'm going to stop talking now because again, I could go on forever, but I imagine there are other questions and I don't want to step on your toes. I mean, it's, it's exactly, I mean, you're touching on something that's relevant as uh 
what's happening now um, because we are in what they call a crypto winter and the prices went down. So because of, NF of, of cryptocurrency and because of NFT sits on blockchain, that drove also the price and the value of NFTs down. So a lot of people, and I know that preparing that panel, that discussion we had with Anya, so it's like how is NFT, NFT a good investment, you know, or is there long-term viability? And so I'd love for you, Peter and, 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 and Sarah, to bring your opinion. I'll just say um, I have considered that there were different pockets of the market of NFTs. And uh, what you just said, Sarah, about PFP and memes, um, which reach incredibly high prices, like we know the board apes and the punks, they can go for millions. Um, do they have viability in this space? To me, they are very speculative products and they are also uh, probably what we can identify at what was written about as Ponzi schemes. So I don't wanna get into the debate, but there is this. But then there is um, NFT as a technology and what it allows for artists to do. So here, what do you think, um, Sarah, in terms of how you shape you know, um, agreements and how you attend to the needs of artists and collectors and organization, how do you handle that um, question of, the viability of NFT and the legal aspect, and how do you build that around that that legal framework around NFTs? So those are some really big questions, and I think it's important to understand that, you know, in some ways, and I'm not at all reveling in people's um, <clears throat> struggles with the market at this point, but in some ways, the crypto winter is a really good thing because it's shaking out a lot of the bluster and bluff and baloney that was floating around um, for the last couple of years. What we have now is a real recognition that there is a technology here that can be used very well by artists. It can be used by organizations wanting to raise money. It can be used by marketing folks who want to um, put utility into the NFTs and, and sell various products, whether it's music or video games or entertainment. What's become very clear is what I've been saying from the beginning, which is that NFTs are an empty cardboard box into which you put content. And it's really important to understand that you can't, I mean, saying I'm going to collect NFTs is like saying, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to collect houses or I'm going to, you know, it's like it's, it's a category of, uh, or I'm going to, I'm going to collect cardboard boxes. Um, you're not really saying very much about what you're actually doing if you just talk about NFTs generally. I am not an investment person. I would never give advice about investing. Um, but certainly, I think that you're in, in a much more likely position of playing hot potato with a PFP project than you are um, when you're talking about fine art. And fine art is going to develop its own marketplace. Um, it already has developed its own marketplace. And so, if people are coming to the, the digital space, wanting to engage with artists and with meaningful art projects and do good work and focus on artists' rights issues, this is actually a really exciting space to be in. There's a lot of excellent work being done. Um, one of the things that, that Peter has done that's been very difficult, people have talked a lot about it, um, is to create projects that are truly collaborative projects where every artist who's involved is rewarded for their participation and benefits from any of the sales that happen. That's really special and new and different. And it, it, it's a way of um, doing that uh, where you're not going to have the, the same potential conflicts that can come up in the um, in the in the real world. I hate to say the real world, but, you know, this is all the real world, ultimately. Um, so those kinds of things are, are really important. And I do think that there is viability long term here. Um, it, but I, I certainly wouldn't say that all NFT projects or you know, everything on the blockchain is going to be viable. I certainly think that if people are engaged in participating with artists and participating with the marketplace, just as the art market goes up and down, the NFT market for fine art is going to go up and down. And we're also going to see different things happening with blockchain technology. So 
NFTs are a, a way of packaging artwork, packaging experiences. It's going to be about community. It's still about building audience, just as it is always in, within the art market. It is not magical to create NFTs. They don't sell themselves. You have to actually get out there and, and market them and, and you know, figure out who the audience is for them. That's where if you look at um, the Bored Apes or the Crypto Punks or those other projects that um, really are very speculative and financial in nature. Um, that's where I think you'll see the difference in terms of how Peter markets his projects. And that is a direct relationship between the artist and the collector and the artist and the other artists that he's collaborating with. So you're very close to what's actually happening. Whereas the other projects really are about you know, how high can we pump the value of this and how long is it going to stay? And so it's a, a game of hot potato. Very well said, Sarah. And the one thing that about PFPs that a lot of people may not realize is that they're not created by artists. They're created by a group of people or sometimes a, a company. Uh, Board Apes is owned by Yuga Labs and crypto. they bought CryptoPunks as well. Uh, as of this year. So um, a lot of times these projects are just, you know, speculative type collectibles. So usually when you see anybody on Twitter with a PFP, or it could be also said as a profile pic of an animal, usually those are not really created by artists. They're created by uh, a company or a group of people trying to create and cash in on this uh, uh, thing where broad apes really and crypto punks really kind of led. Um, um, this whole thing. Um, but um, in, in saying that the 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 whole PFP with the, the animal gifts and stuff like that, I think that's a phase that is actually really kind of phasing out at a certain point because we're seeing that uh, with this, as Sarah said, with the crypto crypto winter, uh, it's really clearing out a lot of these projects that that are we're really just filling up the glut of the space and really, couldn't cash in on the same momentum that Bored Apes did. And uh, we're seeing like, you know, there's a lot of clearing. So whoever is left at this certain point, uh, and if they still are, are viable and, and they still survive this, that means that they're, they're pretty much uh, are, 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 are validated and, and whatnot. So, and for what I do, you know, I, I'm kind of, I kind of go about two prong way with the crypto side, with the NFT side, we're trying to engage a community there on the uh, on Twitter and which is basically where everything is found. So if you're gonna kind of get to more know about things, you can look up articles as Mural said, but a lot of these things are on Twitter. So a lot of the education and where people are sharing things are on Twitter. Um, so, you know, uh, but I, you know, in engage that community, but I also engage uh, like traditional art collectors and try to educate them about what uh, what I do and what basically an NFT is and how to open a wallet and educate them and how to, to kind of go through these process because it can be quite daunting to try to figure out how to even open a wallet and how to interact with the blockchain in general. And especially me being on a blockchain that isn't Ethereum, that is an algorithm, which I did a lot of research and it is for me the most robust and it's never failed. Uh, the transaction fees are very low. So it has real world use cases. And um, that was something that was very interesting to me in general. Um, so, and, and saying that, you know, we're seeing a lot of these uh, art, art, the more artistic way of approaching NFTs and conceptual ways that are actually, you know, uh, museums are starting to kind of come around and, and acquire these things. And uh, uh, I think with longevity of NFTs, that that has to be a certain tied to the art world as well because to really totally uh, uh turn your back on that side it, it's not going to work because we see with uh conservation and that mural does and stuff that it really these are the people that uh and organizations institutions that really take care of works and for the future of what what the history of it as well you know so uh yeah Peter, how do you price your work? Can you give us an idea of the value? I know you currently have, first of all, you issue a new exhibition that is sold as one NFT, but there are several of them. It's like an edition. So you release every couple of months. And how? what does it cost? I know there are some are available now for yes. people to actually uh, acquire. 
So it, you know, I'm I'm kind of playing on a similar model how editions are seen in the art world. So if it's a higher edition, it's a lower price, and if it's a lower edition, a higher price. Um, initially, I set the the bar. So I we the very first NFT that we sold was back in June of 21, and it was called Freeport, where essentially I was commenting on NFTs and in but in a quite a subversive way where I recreated the Luxembourg Freeport. Uh, to scale and and to spec where you can actually walk into it, which is not actually a public space you can actually walk into physically, but in this space you can. And I placed uh, curate a bunch of artists within that. And so in that certain way, I was kind of commenting on the relationship between NFTs and free ports where you can kind of hide certain goods and and launder money or something like that. But I, at the same time, I've been I introduced an equitable model. So that was. I think the very first edition was sold for about seventeen thousand dollars, but that's ninety four ninety four algo at the time. So I set prices at in relationship to algo. So I'm not trying to really think about the dollar price that much. I'm just trying to maintain what the algo price is. What What is the algo? Can you give us right now? I think it's uh point three four to the dollar. And the algo is a currency that is used on the Algorand blockchain. Correct. So say, for example, on Ethereum, which is ETH, it's I think it's a hit fourteen thousand fourteen hundred dollars uh, per token. So if you have one token and it's it would be fourteen hundred dollars. Uh, and so <clears throat> so when you see things on OpenSea, you probably see things that are like point one ETH or point three ETH on the average for an artwork. Um, and that means it's, you know, maybe like three or four hundred dollars and sort of like that. So, um, yeah, pricing is, is a weird thing in the, in, the, in the NFT kind of space. But what I'm trying to do is just trying to maintain and kind of uh, uh, to the trajectory of what the Algorand price is so that um, uh, it kind of maintains this certain flow. Currently, the one that the, the, the unprotected show that I just showed, there is only one edition left out of five. And that is currently priced at, uh, I think right now it's under $4,000. But if Algorand goes back up, then it's worth this price. So it's a different way of thinking. So it's not on pegged to the dollar price, it's pegged to an Algorand price, which is a certain thing. But yes, there's certain ways of the NFT can fluctuate as in what the market is up and down, but that's that's the way that's the way it is. I would really prefer and the technology isn't quite there yet where I can peg my price to a USDC or USDT, which is a stable token, which is pegged to the US dollar to kind of create more stability within that, that but that technology hasn't been developed yet quite yet. Um, as then is controversial as well, but we'll uh, pass on that. And I wanted to touch on the question of rights. Um, because with certain NFTs, for instance, the CryptoPunk and um, the Board Apes, uh, Board Apes, uh, they would tell you that you own all the rights to do anything you know you want, and you have commercial rights with them. I may be wrong. Sarah is going to be too <laughs> able to give us more accurate and extensive information on that. But what do you have, um, Sarah? Do you want to talk about this like freely, and then maybe see what you have done with Peter? Sure. Um, so the bottom line is, is that you don't get anything with NFTs that you don't get with regular artwork. So if you go into a gallery and you purchase a painting off the wall, you receive the painting. You don't receive any of the underlying rights. That, that remains with the artist. The only way to transfer copyrights is in a signed writing by the author of that work. The same holds true for NFTs. So if you buy an NFT, all you get is the NFT. You're, you're purchasing um, the ability to essentially hold in your wallet um, whatever artwork, assuming we're talking about artwork NFTs, uh, is attached to that NFT. Um, if you want more rights, then you have to either negotiate that and have a separate contract or the artist, if the artist wishes to, to transfer more rights, um, they need to somehow indicate that they're doing that. So the challenge has been in the space that uh, the PFP projects CryptoPunks, Moonbirds, CryptoKitties, like oh, there's a whole host of these, thousands of these projects at this point. Um, and they've been very unclear about what rights transfer and what rights don't. And that's led to a lot of confusion and a lot of bad feelings in the space. 
initially the way that they were um, conveying the rights was through terms and conditions or terms of service on the website, the marketplace website. That's problematic because once you have your primary sale and that's done and it's out there in the um, in the in the NFT landscape, it can be sold on any um, compatible platform. You may or may not go back to the original website and look at those terms and conditions or terms of service and see what rights go with that uh, particular project. Maybe that website goes down at some point. So then you're left with an NFT that has no articulation with it. So I've been really clear with clients that um, not only should their terms and conditions in terms of service be very clear about the rights that travel with the NFT, but they need to clarify that in their frequently asked questions. Again, those are things that are going to be on that initial marketplace website. They need to look at the metadata fields, as we talked about a little bit earlier, to see if there's anything that can be indicated within those metadata fields that would signal that there are additional rights or additional restrictions placed on the use of those NFTs. And then the best way right now is to attach an agreement through the metadata that specifically articulates which rights travel with the um, NFT and which rights do not. Um, you can register an NFT, you can register the artwork that's attached to an NFT for copyright, and you can also attach the right within the NFT for someone to receive that copyright registration. So if I sell an NFT and say, I'm going to transfer with it all of my copyrights and I will transfer to you, collector, the copyright ownership, then I could actually go to the copyright office and file those documents to say that I've transferred the copyright. So it's really important to understand that NFTs do not exist in a vacuum. They do not exist outside of the intellectual property rules that exist already. And we have to pay attention to that. That's something that has definitely gotten lost um, and is, is also the basis for so much of the litigation that we're starting to see now is this disconnect uh, because you do have a Web3 community that feels like, oh, it's an NFT. It's somehow subject to different rules. People don't understand you are still, you know, in the universe, you are still on the planet, you are still subject to the rules that apply to um, anything that you're purchasing that's not digital. So I hope that gives you sort of an, an overview. I think it does. I, I guess it, also the other thing. Yeah, you go ahead. You had also asked about um, how it related to Peter's work. And um, that was sort of the, the point at which Peter and I started talking was around this idea of like what rights do attach, what rights um, need to be articulated. And so what Peter wanted, and Peter had a very clear idea of where he wanted to take this because of, of course, his articulation is also really part of the artwork that he's doing about being very clear and, um, and direct about what, what is and is not included in that NFT. And so the, the collector's agreement, which you can see when you go on his website, there's a link to the collector's agreement so you can read that. Um, but you can see it's, it's, a, it's a fairly discursive document, not just like strictly legal terms, but also a discussion around the importance of, um, of positioning this project in the way it's positioned and the, the importance of recognizing artists and the labor of artists and the value of, of what the artists are bringing. And so we have some really exciting opportunities to fully articulate and include those contractual tools and those intellectual property constructions as part of the artwork itself. And that's, to me, of course, as a nerdy lawyer, very exciting. That, that's really, that's really, really interesting. Peter, would you be able to link um, if it's available, what, where it's available, if uh, any of our audience members would like to look at a great example of right agreements? And meanwhile, I'd like to open um, the discussion to, to whoever would have a question or comments to make on the subject. Muriel, thank you. 